Good morning, I'm Pastor Tim, and on behalf of Pastor Katie and the whole community here at Holy Trinity, we're truly glad that you have found us online today as we join together to receive God's Word, celebrate God's Supper, and offer up our gifts collectively of our prayer and our praise to Christ our Savior, to receive again all of the blessings that belong to Christian community. We're going to be continuing this on-demand service in coming weeks and hope to add a updated virtual live stream service from the sanctuary on Facebook Live. Again, it's going to be relaunching on November 1st. So bear with us amidst all the changes as we train the volunteers, as we put our pieces in place so we can welcome you to that live service on November 1st. In October, we're also going to be meeting with Sunday School Youth live via Zoom each Sunday at 10 a.m. If you haven't already gone to Planning Center and registered your child, please do so. That's the link to get the emails for that Zoom link. And again, our older youth are also meeting each group one at a time live on, on each Wednesdays. And they're also combining Zoom with that too. So um, just to, again, lots of different ways to, to meet, lots of different things to keep track of though, certainly in that. But just like you have to schedule so many other aspects of your life, we hope you'll be part of this one as well. This week, we're going to also be training the hosts of our Community Connection Ministry. So I would ask that you keep them in prayer, that ministry in prayer, as you go through your week and as we begin this, this uh, time together. And also, we're going to be looking at, again, beefing up our tech team so that we can do this live streaming in a way that's as, as fruitful and feels as natural as possible. So let's know, give thanks for all of that. Again, visit the website if you have other questions. But we'll take a moment just to center ourselves with a moment of quiet, ready our hearts and our minds to offer up these gifts of prayer and praise to God this morning. As we do, once again, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. We begin with our opening song.
Would you pray with me, please? O sovereign God, erase your throne in our hearts. Created by you, let us live in your image. Created for you, let us act for your glory. Redeemed by you, let us give you what is yours. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Katie, and this is Gus. Gus knows that there's snacks just right around the corner. In fact, who you've never met is our other dog. Her name is Ivy. And they both know that if they just were to hang out just a little while, it'd be really, really good that they could get snacks. It's one of the rules. You know, when our kids were little, no one could eat in this room. In fact, that this room was off limits. In fact, we wanted it to be special because after all, it's where we um, did life. It was the living room. There was a moment where we changed the rule because why would we have the most special room in the house be ba basically off limits to where life was taking place in the house? So we learned that if we wanted to live in this room, the rules had to fit the space. You know, I've been thinking a lot, a lot about what's going on at your schools and in your homes and of course places where we work and in our neighborhoods about sometimes we have rules in our house that when we are outside, or in our schools or places, we think there should be different rules on how we treat one another. Somehow when we're at home, we either treat each other really, really well or really, really crummy or vice versa. We have different rules of dignity for people in our homes than maybe we do in our schools and where we work and in our neighborhoods. God calls us today to not have just specialized rules in our government or specialized rules in schools but treat each other with a specialness, a care that says, I love you most of all. You are my beloved. That when we look at one another, we say to one another, you are valued. And the value that I have in you, well, it's because you are just like me, a child of God. We don't hold back and only put on our Christian face, face um, once in a while. We sit here and say, you know what? All the time, 24 seven, we have a relationship with God and we love one another because God loved us first. Whatever's going on in your week this week, it is that simple. Maybe oversimplified, but once again, this message, God loves you and we are called to love one another. You know what? Let's do something big this week. Let's love in ways that that are extra tender. Let's love in ways that the world does not understand, but let's not make it a special rule to love only those we love. Let's love the unlovable, especially saving room when we're the ones that are the unlovable. Hey, whatever's going on your week this week, or going on for you this week, you're loved, forgiven, now and always. The law, yes, follow the rules. The gospel, it sets us free. Hey, let's pray together. When I pray, I like to fold my hands. I like to close my eyes, bow my head because we're talking to God. Would you pray with me, please? Dear God, thank you for loving us, for giving us forever. And all God's people said, amen. Our first reading today comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 1 through 10. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, 
so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has surrounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Our second lesson comes from Matthew 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test? You hypocrites, show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Hi, I'm Pastor Katie. Before we dig deeper into our passages today, I invite you to pray with me. Let us pray. God of all creation, we sing to you a new song. Bless us this day and all the days ahead. Encourage us to sing of your glory to all the nations, sharing the marvelous works among all your peoples. Great are you, Lord. You are to be revered above all gods and all the earthly idols that we foolishly attempt to make more important than you. You, O oh God, are Lord and King. All creation comes before you once again with humble hearts, full of joy, for you are indeed our God, and we trust this to be our good news today and every day. May the words that are spoken today be the words you intend to your listeners to hear and in hearing together we share. We pray this in all things in your name, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. Politics and living out our faith politics and living out of faith. We're getting to the point where we can't talk about anything because we're so afraid to talk about things of substance infused with our faith. So guess what? Today, the passages that were selected, they were selected a long time ago. And any church that's using the lectionary, just like we are, they are reading these exact passages and doing the same work that you and I are going to do together. What are we going to do? We are going to dig deeper in what it means to be a child of God, a disciple of Christ. This thing called politics and living out our faith. Hang in there with me. I want to um, read with you from a magazine called Living Lutheran. You can get a copy of this anytime you would like. It happens to be that the title of this month's edition was How Should Lutherans Be Involved in Politics? So I want to read to you what I, uh, they have some quotes from members of congregations from all over, and I too have heard these same exact um, uh, responses from parishioners through some of the many congregations I've ser served. Maybe you have a response that you felt right away when you saw the title, Politics and Living Out Our Faith. It goes like this. One member said, not from our congregation, from congregations in this magazine, said, Hey, Pastor, I'm really upset by Sunday's sermon. You're meddling in politics, which you have no business doing. I also hear that you participated in some of those recent protests. Don't you understand the separation of church and state? Another member, not here, but quoted in this magazine, said, Some of us are frustrated that our church won't take a stand. 
Aren't we named for our protester, Martin Luther? Don't we point with reverence to martyrs like Diedrich Bonhoeffner, who took a very political stance? Another member, once again, not from here, quoted in this magazine says, as a young person, I am deeply concerned about social justice and I find little to no support for my convictions in my church. And finally, a member quoted said this, I don't want my church to tell me how to vote, but I would welcome some guidance on how to prayerfully cast my ballot. What's your quote? What are you saying? What is stirring your heart today? Let's dig deeper into that. Let's go ahead and have that conversation. Let's do it because we know it's on our minds and all of the congregations will be having the same conversation. Can you imagine what could happen if together, congregation after congregation, we lowered our anxiety, opened our ears, let our hearts be melted if we were to listen to one another and have a good conversation about what it means to be a child of God, disciple of Christ. In our passage today from the Gospel of Matthew in verse 16, I want to set it up a little bit. Uh, Jesus is in the thick of his ministry. He has been going out with his disciples, his followers, his chosen people, and they have gone out into the world. But he has met with other disciples, which means other followers of other thinking. Uh, in this case, religious leaders from his Pharisees and also government leaders. And they've gathered together and they're going to trick him. In fact, it says that they are trying to entrap him. Entrap him into saying something that not only could get him killed, but definitely would not share the good news of who Christ is or who God is. Hold on. In the Gospel of Matthew, verse 16, it says, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and, the te and you teach the way of God in accordance with truth and you show difference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Isn't it always the way, right before you say something a little conflicting, you might try and, and, and soften your, your sitting, set, setting a little bit? But I think they were sincere. I think as followers, they were sincere. But they were saying, hey, if you really are who you say you are, and we've seen you to be true, you speak as a teacher. And you claim to be speaking truth, and we think that you are truthful. And you look at one another, at all of the people you encounter with equitability. You treat them with dignity. But then they say, but, it's not in there, but, or however, or maybe it's something like, hey, we think you don't know the answer to this. They ask in verse 17, so tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? These questions remember being asked by students of leaders, trying to trip him up. And I wonder what our question is for Jesus today. Jesus continues, he knows their heart and he knows your heart. When you ask questions of what it means to be a citizen that is also a, dis, a disciple of Christ. Because he knows this, when they ask this question, listen up, when they ask this question, it says in verse 18 and 19, but Jesus was aware of their malice. He says, why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin you used for tax. Remember how we ask the question. When we ask God, oh Lord, show me the way, it is not the same as when your question has a motive or is in this case has malice behind it. It continues. They bring him a denarius, which is a coin. In verse 20, then he says to them, whose head is on this coin? Whose title? In verse 21, they answer, it is the emperor's. Then he said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. Pause. 
Give things that have a mark of the coin to the emperor and give God the things that are God's. Remember the people who are testing him. Believe there is but one God and is the God of all creation. What is their reaction? And these followers, these disciples, in verse 22, when they heard this, they were amazed and they went away. We don't know if they go back to their leaders. We don't know what happens, but they go away. Their hearts hopefully have been transformed. They've taken their thinking, their anger, their malice, and they have heard and they were amazed. When's the, the last time you've heard something Maybe in the last month, days, even hours, and you were amazed, you were inspired, you felt your heart be full, maybe content, but not complacent, eager, you just don't know how. What words of truth have you fully engaged in and you're feeling like you just want to share this news with somebody because what you will speak is truth. And when they hear you, they will know that the words you speak are that as a child of God and a disciple of Christ. What does your family, your children, your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors, what truth are you sharing with them that you would be willing to take a stand for? They were trying to entrap Jesus meaning they were trying to make him make a mistake so that he could get killed for what he said. They were trying to get him into a political debate as if there is a right and wrong, and they missed the point that the questions they were asking, the Son of God, were questions of this earth. And God, through the words of Jesus, through the giving act of Jesus, says, fine, these are things of this world. Do you not understand I am of the heavens. I am God's gift of grace. Now you do not understand. But listen up and be amazed. The question most likely then for it wasn't asked and don't you wish Jesus had asked it. In fact, a scholar of this congregation pointed it out to me and it moved me because it's so simple, right? What they, they don't ask is simply this, who has the authority? We proclaim in our understanding of who we are as the ELCA, as members of this church, that God has authority over creation to create. Jesus has authority to conquer death. And the Holy Spirit has authority to move us, to inspire us, to keep us attached to the living word of God and to act towards one another, speaking truth in love, forgiveness, and grace. They are trying to trip him up in this political debate. What do you hear and what are you sharing? And how do we on our own, how do we take the message from Jesus Christ, the fullness of who God is, and speak that message of hope in a 24-7 world, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I had an appointment this morning. And I parked my car into the parking lot, a spot I always park in. And I didn't take notice, but just in a passing by of the car that was next to me. It looked full. It looked packed. One of the windows broken out. You know what my thought was? Is my car safe? I went to my appointment and I came back to my car and that, that other car sitting next to my car was still there. And that's when I realized they're living in their car. Their circumstance has caused them to live in their car. I look and they're both asleep. I'm almost relieved because then I can, can pray, but not disturb. See, the passage today doesn't mean anything until you ask the question and do the work who has the authority and to whom's authority do you belong? 
when I say, for myself. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I am making my political statement right there and then. And it means that what I think and how I act lays on the foundation that I am a sinner in need of God's grace and I have been gifted through Jesus Christ life everlasting forgiveness and I have been restored with my God. That means today at my appointment, when the person across the table from me is speaking and wears an attire that is different than mine, whose skin color is different than mine, whose headpiece is different than mine, we find a commonness because we're both moms. We start talking about our children and where they go to school and our hopes and dreams for our children. We do so with dignity, acknowledging that she is a woman of faith, different than my own. I am a woman of faith, and it is my faith that I must be held accountable to as I treat her with dignity and graciously receive the abundant kindness that she has given to me. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. This means that it is the statement, in this very statement is the foundation of my heart for inclusivity. It is what causes me to feel compassion for those who are hurting and those who hurt others. It is my desire to be humbled in order so that I listen and learn first to those whose understanding of this world is different than my own. And it is for me to speak truth for those who are in need of dignity and justice. The question according to my wise elder again is one we cannot miss this day. It is who has the authority and we as children of God surrender our authority to the authority of God. Who has authority? Who would you say has authority in your life? To whom are you listening? What filter do you hear the world around you? And what do people know you believe that you stand for? And the answers that have immediate political consequences in their time have the same consequences in our time. When we claim that indeed Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. This means he was a threat then and that means he's a threat today but not with fists. He is a threat because it lowers, lowers our anxiousness, it lowers our fear so that we can receive the fullness of God in one another. Who do you and I say in this moment has authority? Indeed, it is rightly so that we have been taught that there is a real purpose and a need for separation of church and state. However, what we learned in high school government classes can often be missed as we grow away farther and farther from those days. The fullness of the statement written by leaders who experienced in their own lifetime something similar to what the Romans were speaking of in their time, where the, the head of the nation is either viewed as a god or there is a church being run by the king. And the original composers, the writers of our laws, were weary not to make this state mistake. But the law meant that the government may not declare a state church by which it not only rules, but raises funds to keep it in existence and demands my participation as a citizen in it. The law of this land means I must abide, but it didn't mean that people of faith should act anything different than the faiths that they hold that are the foundations of who they are if they are indeed speaking truth. Kindness, compassion, integrity, and decency for one another. For people of faith, regardless of how they understand God, Come to a God who creates, a God who continues to care for, and in our understanding, 
a God that calls us to social justice. What does this mean? In the ELCA, we have what's called statements, social statements. And I invite you to go ahead and look them up, the ELCA.org uh, social messages, ELCA.org slash advocacy, or ELCA um, where it uh, talks about uh, living uh, a life where you can be a voice piece for others. I invite you to go to those. Oh, so I'm gonna push that over just a little bit. Because as you do so, I think you'll see the fullness of the statement and not little sound bites that we seem to recite over and over again. Once again, reading from our living Lutheran, we hear this message that was uh, written so well and composed so well by the author. And the author of this article is, um, is also quoted as Michael Cooper White. He gathers this information as he does so. He reminds us that as a Lutheran, the Lutheran confessional principles remind us that law and government are gifts from God for the ordering of creation. God intends for government, government to protect society and enable it to flourish. We are called to have this, congregate, this conversation about politics and our faith because we are responsible citizens. And in doing so, we care for our neighbor and the betterment of all citizens. This is indeed our calling. This pastor will not tell you how to vote. This pastor will encourage you to vote. Get out there and vote. Let your understanding of your walk with Christ be known. I want to make sure that you hear this message. It is important that you know that I, as an ELCA pastor, will not preach, mandate, predict which candidate to vote for in public office. But as pastors, churches, and as a denomination, we encourage and urge all members to be active members of our community in this USA. Exercise our right as citizens to vote. This is our participation in the betterment of care for all citizens. Therefore, the leaders we elect must align in our best judgment as citizens, as people who are trustworthy, who will care for all citizens with equality, dignity, and respect. In the words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, I'm going to summarize and leave us with this. Greetings to you, my beloved by God. Dear sisters and brothers, as you proclaim in all you say and do, the Lord is my Savior. The Lord is the risen one. I am praying for you to God constantly and I'm remembering in those prayers your work of faith, your labors of love, your steadfastness and the hope in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit continue and may it continue to inspire you, encourage you and teach you how to love your neighbor as God loves you first, loves you always and loves you forever. This is our good news. Amen.
Let's now respond to the word with a chance to share the prayers of the church together, including our petitions this week. Our, our new synodical bishop, uh, Reverend Amy Current, who begins her ministry this month. And also we want to keep in mind all the voters of our state and our country as we carry out our civic duty together. So let us pray. Lord, as we gather today, we remember the authority under which we stand and serve. We give thanks for those who are willing to be public servants. We ask your help and it's really not taking them for granted. We know that the good government has a place and serves well to establish and maintain peace and order. We also ask your help in remembering that our first and primary loyalty is to you, our Lord and our Savior. May that connection be the criteria by which all other priorities and decisions are judged. Meanwhile, God, we pray for the voters of our, our county, our state, our nation, that they would each be responsible in researching candidates and setting aside assumptions and falsehoods and voting their conscience. Whoever we vote for, may our mindsets be not only one of self-interest, but one mindful of the nation, of the world, and of the future. Father, you've entrusted your church to leaders, whether of synods, of congregations, or of individual ministries. We pray in thanksgiving today for our new bishop, Amy Current, as she begins her ministry among us. For the leaders of our Community Connection Ministry, as they are trained this week, and for those who step forward to help us be able to live stream worship in these coming colder months. That each of those roles and those ministries might be fruitful indeed. We pray too, Father, for those who are striving to address the tragedy of COVID-19, for those who lost loved ones, or jobs, or educational opportunities, or mental health, or just the chance to connect with those they love. Be with the scientists and the labs and the researchers who are striving so hard to create that widely distributable vaccine that they might find success in the coming months. Father, we also want to remember today certainly those who are ailing in body or mind or spirit. We ask that you be with those who are recovering from surgery, those who are suffering from addiction, or Alzheimer's or depression or grief, those who are again just crying out for, for loved ones who are so far away and feeling alone. For all others, God, that we would perhaps lift up before you now. that each of them, too, might know your peace. And then, God, for all the many petitions we raise before you, whether spoken with our lips or just within the quiet of our hearts. Whatever our need, Lord, whatever our longing, hear these petitions on behalf of others and ourselves and sustain us as we await the coming of your Son, and his kingdom in all of its fullness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You know, Jesus stood among those first disciples, as we recalled last week, and said, you know, peace be with you. My peace I give you. And so today, even though we are worshiping virtually, we ask and offer the chance for you and I to extend both the sign and a word of that same peace to one another. Let's pause and do that now, can we? Now with the whole church, let's be confess our sins before God and one another. For if we have, we say we have no sin in us, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is ever rich in mercy, reminds us that even when you and I were dead in sin, God made us alive together in Christ. For by grace, we have been saved. 
And so it's in the name of Jesus Christ that your sins and my sins are announced as forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit so that Christ might live in your hearts again today through the gift of faith that is ours. Amen. You know, as we change gears to uh, celebrate the meal before us today, we're reminded that on the night which he was betrayed, Jesus instituted the sacrament known as, as Holy Communion. And when we join together in Holy Communion and worship, we hear those words of institution, the words that, that tell the story of how this sacrament was begun. It's found in four different scripture sources. And generally, the sacrament of communion is, is held within the gathered assembly of disciples, gathered assembly of believers. But we join together this meal each Sunday that we're able to do that because it works those promises of forgiveness, of sins, of life, and of salvation. Unfortunately, at this time, because we are limited in our ability to gather together to join in this sacrament in person, we have to resort to trusting that the power of God to forgive sin and to give life and to both bestow salvation are not limited just to those contexts. Because as Lutherans, we believe that this sacrament has three parts, a physical object, God's word, and God's command to do this in communion. And so in communion, the physical elements are the bread and the wine, or again, the grape juice in some places. And the gathered believers, whether wherever they are, join together in the promise of Jesus to receive those promises through these gifts. In times of emergencies, in times when we can't be together, we entrust the sharing of this sacrament within the home. Since that's the only gathering of Christians that some are able to have at this point in time. And so starting again this Sunday, you are invited to partake of a virtual Holy Communion in your own home. And if you live alone, Christ is present with you. Know that. Trust that. If you live with others, invite them to partake of this gift with you. And if you don't wish to receive communion in this way, we understand, certainly, because we trust that Christ is present with us through the Word, too, and through worship in any form, and in community, in any form we can find that at this time. For this remembrance today, again, you need the words again that uh, I will, be, will be sharing with you. And you'll need, again, the bread or some other grain-based food, the wine or grape juice. And if you don't have those items, remember that any single element will certainly suffice. Any simple food items you do have available will also qualify. And so, we recall again those words of institution, and the great thanksgiving that Christ offered up for us. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. The night when she was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you, so do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, Jesus also took the cup. He gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink. He said, take and drink, each of you. This cup is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood, shed for you, shed for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, too, for the remembrance of me. So taking the bread item you may have in front of you, you may they say to the person that you are communing, the body of Christ given for you. And then, taking the cup or wine or juice, say to the person you are communing, the blood of Christ shed for you. And as we savor this meal, may these gifts of our Lord's body and our Lord's blood bless you and keep you in God's grace now 
and forever as we pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Once again, now may these gifts of our Lord's body and blood strengthen you, encourage you, bless you, keep you close to Christ, and always in God's grace. Amen.
Thanks so much for being part of our worship today. And now may the Lord bless and keep and encourage you and embolden you to go about being the hands and the feet and the voice of Christ for your neighbor, for the whole world's sake, in your corner of God's creation this week. Again, please visit the website for more updates to learn more about what's going on here at Holy Trinity this week. But go now in peace to love, to live, and to share Christ. Thanks be to God.